Scammers, good morning, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, welcome, 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 thank you for joining me for another study stream. <laughs> hi, 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 I hope everyone's been super well, hopefully the music's not too loud or too zzzzzz, but I've been really in the mood for late autumn, late night, late whatever else, coffee shop, rainy vibes. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that's okay. I feel like a little ridiculous in my Halloween costume and trying to study it, but you know what? I need the motivation. If I'm like, if I dress cute, I'll learn cute, you know? <laughs> anyway, let's kind of get to it. Let me say my hellos and then we'll get started and I'll explain what we're doing, how we're doing, or maybe I should do that first. Ah, okay, fine. That makes more sense. Uh, so, uh, welcome every cup. <laughs> <laughs> Today I'm going to study stream about, uh, I think the best way to sum it up is called movement science. So we're going to talk about like theories, different kind of impairments, how we learn how to move, how we learn like to do any sort of task, how we learn in general. We're not getting like super neuroscience here or going picking the brain, but like really just general concepts that are really not too hard to understand, but understand that people have created certain models for these things and then we'll go from there. I was kind of working on the study guide like at 11 p.m. yesterday. <laughs> and then guess what? I found that my other classmate had a study guide already done. And don't get me wrong. I love that man. That man has blessed me with so many good study guides and we always work on like our online study guides together. But I did not see that. <laughs> so I've been doing this all from scratch. I've been working trying to find the answers for myself. No way. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, some of it's a little bit incomplete, but we can uh, kind of go on and off and we can switch in between. I like the formatting of my study guide just a little bit better just because it's what I'm most familiar with. That That's basically it. If not, I would be using a study guide. That is not a problem. But I, I, I spent like an hour or two <laughs> on this, so we're gonna use it, okay? <laughs> 
So yeah, we'll go over the concepts, we'll go over like the quick overview, and then we'll kind of go from there, okay, every cup? The reason why I'm studying today and why I'm doing study streams is because last week I mentioned that this week is my exam week. <laughs> uh, some of it got moved for unforeseen circumstances, which I'm grateful for, don't get me wrong. But, um, it, how do you say it? So I don't really have to necessarily about one other one. But I do still need to study for it, which is why on Thursday we're going to have a study with me stream. Today, I have an exam for this course, the, that like whole movement science stuff. So that's why we're going to be cramming till maybe about two to three hours. And then I'm going to take a small little break and then I will end stream and study with my classmates. So yay! <laughs> So let me say my hellos now that I got that out of the way, and then we'll get into going through this beautiful chef kiss dirty two page study guide. Ah, <laughs> it is what it is though. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Rebel. Hi, hi. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's go. We're going. Finally. <laughs> uh, almost 10 minutes in, but we're going. <laughs> <laughs> hi, SG. Hi, hi. Steady Tim. Lunch Tim. All the Tims. Yeah, like Tim Allen. Yeah, 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 yeah. All the Tims. <laughs> I like to move it, move it, Tim. Thank you, Tommy, for getting the reference. So, you know, I think in the other study stream, I put like, I like to move it, move it when we're studying biomechanics. And I'm like, heck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could reuse the same title. So insert that one song from the hit movie Madagascar. <laughs> and so that's the uh, secret lore behind today's stream. <laughs> hi Rip, hi hi, welcome, let's go, let's go. Thank you, Shay, for shining on Rip, I appreciate ya. Rip, you're playing League? Oh, I don't know why I said that, I was there, but like, League? <laughs> welcome, welcome regardless, and hi Buzz, happy New Year's. <gasps> Happy New Year's, Buzz! Hi, hi! Welcome, welcome! What's your New Year's resolution? As she says, more time with friend. Same, more time with friend. Z. <laughs> with the Z at the end, because I'm cool. <laughs> I don't know. I think really just becoming more uh, active in different ways. Not just physically, but mentally and socially and all that good jazz. I would like to uh, reawaken, if that is a uh, good word to say. Sometimes it could be a recluse, to be honest. <laughs> I don't really mean to be a shut-in by any means, but if life if I had the ability. <laughs> but no worries, no worries. Ichi, hi by the way, hi hi! Thank you for the posture check. I will politely uncross my ankles. <laughs> I'll politely hydrate. I have some uh, coffee with me. I, I ran out of milk, <laughs> which is like a heinous crime by the way at my household. And when I mean my household, I mean within myself. <laughs> I am a uh, cookie cereal monster. I'm a cereal monster. I guess I'm also a cookie monster too. <laughs> but I always have almond milk on me because I'm one person and I don't really like the taste of almond milk too much. But for cereal, it's okay. <laughs> and I ran out. I have to go grocery shopping. I ran out of milk for my coffee. <laughs> so my um... One of my roommates let me lend them their Quest protein shake. So I have that in my little bit of coffee. So I'm gonna... Thank you! <laughs> ah, and thank you for everyone contributing to the karaoke challenge! Uh, how far are we? 7%! Let's go! <laughs> I feel like a lot of people have been contributing, and I'm just like, contributing, contributing, and I'm just like, oh god, we're gonna hit it. But we're only 7%! Let's go! <laughs> I got so scared. Hi, John, by the way. Hi, hi, welcome! If she says the song is such a ba uh, banger, God, I love vocal chops. Me too. I love, I love distorted. I love experimental. I love anime. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Ashi. Thank you for shouting out Ichi. By the way, welcome, welcome. <gasps> Nan, hi, hi. What are we learning today? Uh, just to reiterate, what we're learning today, we're basically learning movement science. If I had to sum it up. <laughs> hi, Golden Dino. Hi, hi. Welcome. Do you like pudding? <laughs> Putting your hands in mine? That's lewd. Get out of here. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hi, Dino. Hi, hi. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> good morning, Baz, by the way. Good morning, good morning. I know, it's so smooth, right? <laughs> and Golden Dino, thank you so very much for the follow. Welcome to the Cup Club. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh. Ah. Oh, gosh. I have to fix my jaw. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I just won't smile that much again. I'm sorry. Uh, a vow of no smiling. Ah! <laughs> no! 
I see my OBS freaking out. OBS, don't freak out on me. I will cry. <laughs> I'm trying to do a redemption arc for yesterday. If you were here yesterday, no, you weren't, by the way. <laughs> so hopefully we have a nice stable stream. Oh no, milk, the enemy in my bowels. Oh no, Baz, I didn't know you were lactose and towel win. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> It's okay, we'll go eat something not dairy. <laughs> dairy fui. But it's almond milk, you can drink that. I mean, maybe you won't like it, but you can drink it without your bowels being like, oh no, unless you're allergic to nuts. Then I guess we have a more serious problem. <laughs> hi, Minty, hi, hi. Morning, Tippa. Morning. Ah. <laughs> I love doing the little slash and all. <laughs> How up? <laughs> A one-time payment? One ten payment of ninety nine 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 nine. Wait, rebirth? Oh yeah, I want to rebirth now. <laughs> do I have? Do I have? Do I, wait, wait, cubs! Wait, 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 wait! I want to rebirth. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This is supposed to be funny, but I'm not fast enough. Ali, oh. <laughs> do I? Do I have my old model here? No. Boo! Boo! I was gonna rebirth to my my first time model. <laughs> But that's probably not the best idea right now, so... Uh, do you mean re-debut? No, 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 rebirth. I wanna, I wanna start over again. <laughs> okay, where am I? I'm too big. Hold on. Uh, is this okay? Was I this big before? Oh, whatever. <laughs> ah, hi, Pals. Hi, hi. Welcome. Hello, Miss Nya. Are you excited for Overwatch too? No! <laughs> I mean, I'll play it. I'm, I'm. Oh no, I didn't mean to click pass. <laughs> Hi, pass. Um, eh, I, I liked Overwatch. I really did, and I didn't actually know the surfers were dying until a few days ago. It makes sense because when you have a two, you should force other people to play. When I played with Big Cam, I just wasn't a big fan of it. I don't like how they changed some of the characters, and I'm not one of those people like, oh my god, they changed my character. I hate it. They should revert back, but uh, actually, they should. <laughs> <laughs> I know why they had changed them to better uh, fit the new game mode that they have in Overwatch 2, but I'm definitely not a big fan of it. Um, apparently you have to port your account too, I have to look more into that. I I'll try it out uh, again, I guess, but I'm, I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> Overwatch 3 is out next year, let's go! <laughs> I'm so slow when it comes to any game, basically. Overwatch 5 is gonna come out and it'll be like, you know what, we should really try Overwatch 2. <laughs> The glory days of season 1 Overwatch was peak. It was so fun. It was. I honestly really like Overwatch to the point that I got like a Mercy Nendroid because I was such a big fan of the game. I ended up selling an Android. <laughs> and I I don't know. I just really enjoyed it and the friends I made. Did I ever tell you that re really weird wacky story where I met someone who lived like the next street over from Overwatch? It was a very interesting experience. <laughs> where are you from? Bearcat Mountain? What part of Bearcat Mountain? This part of Bearcat Mountain. It's <laughs> so fun. I always love bringing up that story. <laughs> what are the odds? I have no idea. I I'll never I'll never have that luck ever again. I'm telling you, my stats for it, my luck stat is already very low. Hi <laughs> hey, hey, welcome. Hey Tippa, how do you make your uh, model animation? Uh, I don't. <laughs> um, if you mean like the face shapes, uh, I can send you a tutorial, but if you mean like general model stuff, uh, oh, that's such an outdated FAQ. I think in, I, I switched from Tumblr to card. Okay, please forgive me. Don't even ask why I did Tumblr, but I just the formatting was very easy for me two years ago. And I think I have something about like if you want to start doing VTV and Muppet, but if you're looking for like face shapes and blends and all that, uh, I recommend uh, looking up the term perfect. Perfect sync, I think, is the term. Vroid? YouTube? <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I feel like a bot. Like, what? <laughs> Run out of time? Oh no! But yeah, I hope that helps or helps answer your question, okay? But if you have any more questions, I'm more than happy to answer it. I just don't like know, you know? <laughs> anyway, oh no, she, you gambled? I gambled too. How's my day going? This is gonna define my day. <sighs> okay, it's fine. <laughs> Anyway, so let's get going, shall we? 
So I'm going to sip some water because though the coffee was very good with the protein shake, I really would like some water. Um, I ended up starting the stream a little bit later today because uh, one of my roommates wanted to go exercising, which was perfectly fine. I love exercising. <laughs> So I'm like, yeah, let's go on a walk. But I haven't been on a treadmill for a very long time. I like to do like the elliptical or the um, or the cycle bike. But uh, I decided to run, so I'm like dying. <laughs> Running? My poor Forever 17 joints. What the actual heck? <laughs> anyway. Mm. 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 Hey. Let's get started because again, I only have about three hours with ECOVs before I have to do this all over again with my other classmates, so heck. <laughs> mm. huh. I don't want to do it, but I have to do it because I need good grades and I need to pass graduate school so I can live a nice life. I just have to re tell myself that over and over. <laughs> so let's get started. So. I don't want to really go over the overview right now. We're going to just kind of like scroll through it and we'll hit each topic one by one because the overview is just me to be like, I, I love using Google Docs because I could bookmark things and I could jump into it, you know? So if I'm ever lost or like, oh, I really don't remember what practice and feedback is, I can like click into it, you know? So that's really why I have that for my reference. <laughs> I go to work now. Money, Tim. Have a good time, friend, with stream. Thank you, friend. I I appreciate it. Thank you for stopping by. Have a good one at work. Haha, <laughs> sucker, you have work. <laughs> I know I shouldn't say that. I I, I love employment too. <laughs> uh, heck, I said time, not Tim. The joke is ruined. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Don't worry. Moe says, sorry to bother you. What I mean is like, you know, your intro, like how you walk. Oh, uh, that's just in the Vroid actual program. So in Vroid, it, there's like a tab to do animations and they have set pre-animations. To actually animate, it's a little tricky. I'm not, not really well versed in that. I know other people are able to animate in a sense that they um, it can do something similar to MMD or the Miku Miku dance, but that's like actual dancing and someone actually animating that and that's just way outside my like realm of knowledge unfortunately, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I, I hope that helped question mark exclamation <laughs> So yeah, let's kind of get into it, okay? So let's talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary impairments. So impairment basically is like, ow, oh, ouchie. <laughs> <laughs> um, primary impairments basically gonna arise directly from the health condition. So maybe you have tinnitus of the rotator cuff, eh, which I'm pretty sure tinnitus is just inflammation of the tendon of your rotator cuff. Your rotator cuff muscle as a refresher is just gonna be like that group of muscles you have on your shoulders to help well rotate. You can do internal rotation, external rotation. Maybe you're trying to wind up a ball, you know, like in the cartoons where they like roll up their arms and they do like 360s and they're like, oh, I'm revving up the ball to draw. <laughs> You know, those kind of muscles on your shoulders. Well, not nuts. Well, you know, uh, they, uh, yeah, they insert. Uh, yeah, they just say shoulders. It's simple. <laughs> so if you have inflammation of the rotator cuff, you might have limited ROM. ROM, again, is going to be the abbreviation for range of motion of the shoulder. You may also have pain and weakness. So it makes sense. Uh, like, hey, when you have a fever, that's a health condition you are impaired because now you have like a high temperature you might be sweating you might shiver like all those kind of stuffs when you have a fever so uh, moving on from primary let's talk about secondary impairment so that's gonna be the result of pre-existing impairment so if our primary was the tendonitis of the rotator cuff our secondary is going to be the result of that pre-existing it's not directly the tinnitus that's going to cause this but it kind of falls in line with it. So, for example, in this uh, scenario, um, developed condition due to increased thoracic kyphosis with forward head rounding, which leads to tinnitus. So, the postural impairment would be a secondary impairment. So, lots of lots of big words, but basically, the uh, thoracic is referring to like the rib cage or that area of your spine uh, around your rib cage. Kyphosis is kind of a it's a nerve. Yeah. It's a normal curvature of your spine, but sometimes you have excessive kyphosis or low doses. It depends on how it's curving. And what happens is that if you have increased, um, excuse me, 
thoracic kyphosis, you're going to end up with forward head rounding. So think about like a hunchback or the hunchback of Notre Dame. Notre Dame? Notre Dame? Huh? <laughs> you know how he's hunched over and leaned over. So even if you replicate that feeling of, hey, I'm leaning in and I'm hunching over, you're going to end up with that forward head posture. Forward head posture is also something that they talk about like with technology use. You know how we look at our phone, maybe we're bored, maybe we're sitting and we're, our head is like down like this looking at our phone. We're kind of encouraging that natural posture of our head hanging low or again that forward head posture. Uh, forward head posture other than like having the rounded shoulders, your head feeling way heavier and just poor posture in general, you may also end up with tinnitus. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a famous Lucio Overwatch line, I think. <laughs> if my memory serves correctly, and tinnitus is going to refer to that ringing in your ear. So, what was all that for? Uh, basically, again, secondary impairment is going to result from the ten uh, tendonitis of the rotator cuff. So, that poor posture is going to happen from the tinnitus because of uh, tinnitus, the tendon. <laughs> oh my gosh, tendonitis. <laughs> tendonitis, not tinnitus. <laughs> Why the words have to be so similar? I cry every single time. <laughs> hi, Tadere. Hi, hi. Welcome, welcome. So, 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 so. Yeah, postural impairment is going to come from tendonitis because that limited range of motion, the weakness, and maybe being more comfortable in a certain position is going to encourage that uh, increased thoracic kyphosis. So, uh. <laughs> so let's move from secondary, we're going to move on to tertiary impairment. Tertiary impairment can also be known as composite impairment, and that's actually, actually going to be the result of multiple underlying causes, which are going to arise from both the primary and secondary. Uh, John Chain says, weird fact, in Japanese they call hunchbacks ne ne nekose cap. <laughs> ah, that's really interesting. Are you familiar with the like stretch exercise called like the cats and camels or something like that? Or cow and camels? I think it's cat and camels. Like, uh, it's like a stretch. So when you do like a little hunchback when you're on the floor, you do like a, uh, a how do you call it? A camel, like a hunch, like the little hump that they have. And for the cat, you know, the, the, the spine goes a little bit more in. You have that curvature in and you're stretching like a cat who's bringing out their paws out and all that jazz. <laughs> And so I, I think it's weird to be like, oh, Hunchback is cat back. Unless the cat's scared. I, I, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, 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 yeah. So tertiary impairments, just to uh, keep going, uh, it's going to be the inability to maintain good balance. That's going to be a really good example of tertiary because it's the complex result of multiple systems. The reason why this person's balance might not be good, which sounds weird because why isn't their balance being good if we were just talking about like inflammation of the tendon on the shoulder? Oh, and I'm so sorry by the way, tendon is a... Um, it's not a ligament. <laughs> tendon is the little piece from the muscle that's going to attach to the bone, by the way. Ligament is bone to bone. So like when we talk about like ligaments in your knee, that's definitely bone to bone. The uh, muscles have tendons and you might have heard that, I guess, also cooking and all that jazz. <laughs> So yeah, the really the, the reason why they have an inability to maintain balance is because from that secondary impairment, because of their increased uh, forward head posture and all that, and them getting tinnitus and the ringing in their ear, your ears are super important. The vestibular cochlear system is super important for balance. So it kind of all comes downhill basically. <laughs> Anytime you have a health condition and it's not addressed properly, you're going to end up with these really weird situations which again doesn't make sense because how we're going to go from shoulder to imbalance but it does happen and it's really important to make sure we are categorizing that so sum up primary impairment directly from the condition secondary is a result of pre-existing impairment so basically this might have been existing already and this is just only coming forward because of the primary and tertiary is just multiple it comes from both primary and secondary so, uh, this one is going to be a little bit lengthy, so I apologize. So we have the, I think this is a better zoom, by the way. Uh, we have the do, 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 framework. So, again, our concept that we're talking about is movement science. 
and we need to learn how to conceptualize how people move how we function and live in a society so pretty much the purpose of all these models that we're going to talk about is to glide glide <laughs> that's another class that's another class <laughs> but guide clinicians through a comprehensive process of patient management and communicating with other health professionals and facilitating educational processes. These different kind of frameworks that we're going to be discussing is going to give a structure to organize clinical practices and the content to interpret uh, clinical information. <gasps> Emmy, Emmy RuPaul, thank you so very much for the follow. Welcome to a cup club. Welcome, welcome. Oh, I said RuPaul. RuPaul. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Welcome to the Cup Club though. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And the data says, how are you, Tiffany? I'm doing good. I'm just zzzzzing. I try to wake I uh, wake up English. I I tried to wake up earlier today, but I wasn't so lucky. I woke up maybe around 9.30 and I'm like, I had to finish the study guide for the stream. <laughs> so it is what it is. <laughs> Anyway, so let's talk about the different kind of frameworks, okay? So we have five of them. We're gonna, well, technically six because the first one's blending in two, but they kind of go hand in hand with one another. So we have the disablement and enablement model. We have the model of function and disability, the ICF model. We have the APTA's uh, patient slash <laughs> client management process. We have the hypothesis-oriented practice, and then we have the evidence-based practice. So, let's talk about the disablement and enablement model. So disablement is basically, if you had to take a guess, it's about disability. So pretty much we begin analysis from the underlying disease or pathology. So we could talk about the tendonitis example of the rotator cuff from earlier when we were talking about impairments. Uh, the disability is you maybe have limited range of motion. You can't wind up for that ball anymore. You can't move your arm 360 because there's pain and weakness and you may not even be able to go the full 360. So what do you do and how, how do we live in our society with that? So we have to understand with the disablement model, it's going to analyze the impact and functional consequence of the acute, the acute, <laughs> of acute or chronic conditions that are gonna compromise the performance and the individual's ability to meet necessary, customary, expected, and desired society uh, functions and uh, roles. So basically the ability to do ADLs. ADLs is just a abbreviation for activities of daily living. So, hey, are you able to get dressed? Are you able to button your shirt? Can you brush your teeth? Can you scratch your back? You know, this is really interesting, but if you were to put both your hands in the back, like one coming from the bottom, one from the top, and you wanted to like touch the fingertips of your fingers by... Uh, this is this is so awkward to explain. Hold on, let me grab a picture really quick. Uh, internal rotation, touching back. I want someone to do it at the same time. They keep doing like separate. Yeah, 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 here it goes. So, uh, this is dealing with the rotator cuff in a sense that internal, uh, rotator cuff can do internal and external rotation. What you see in the image right here is internal rotation of the shoulder. Can your fingers touch? Can your, you, it doesn't have to be so severe, but can you do this? If you can't do it, you might have limited shoulder rotation. And the fingertips just have to be touching. You don't have to like clench like that. That person's just joined off. <laughs> but this is really important because what if someone wanted to like, maybe they have long hair. What if they want to like wash their hair or wanted to again scratch their back? If they have limited range of motion, they're not able to do these sort of activities. But uh, this ability model kind of has a negative connotation so we kind of go to the enablement model it's 
similar to disability, but we're gonna really just focus more on the individual's participation and role of what they're able to do, like the self-care, uh, social aspects, occupational aspects, and recreational activities. And basically, we're gonna explore skills needed to do activities in different environments. So disability is basically what they can can't do basically and enablement is like okay well maybe this person is a person who has experienced an SCI a spinal cord injury maybe they're unable to use their legs but how can we get them to still participate and do the roles that they want to you know live a nice fulfilling life how can we help them get a mo get to move around how can we modify this to make their lives easier you know yeah <laughs> so that's going to be pretty much the main difference. Participation roles for enablement and disablement, the impact and functional consequences, and how their activity might be compromised. To the sleepy, right? Honestly, I feel so bad because I should play some like more upbeat lo-fi, but I've really been feeling like <laughs> coffee, late night rainy coffee shop. <laughs> Maybe I should set the mood too. Hold on. Do I put like a little filter over it? Do I put like an orange filter and I'm like... <laughs> Wait, can I? Hold on. Our source. <laughs> I feel bad for anyone coming in. I'm so sorry. I promise there, there's, there's a, there's a... <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. Ah... <laughs> I don't think orange filter is gonna really do it, huh? <laughs> I'm trying to be, uh, one in the atmosphere. <laughs> I'm trying to, uh, adjust to it. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the website, uh, Shoots, or what? Not the Shoots, not a website. An application called Shoots. And basically, it helps, like, adjust, like, the lighting of, like, someone's model and whatnot to make it really look like they're in that scenery. And I really want to learn how to do it for my model to make it, you know, more aesthetic. <laughs> hi, Lynn, by the way. Hi, hi. Welcome, welcome. Ooga booga. Ooga booga. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect for the Halloween season, all the spooky season. Welcome, welcome. How are you? We're just learning about movement <laughs> and the frameworks that are involved with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -mm. All right. So the ISC model is a biopsychosocial model where environmental and personal factors are integrated with the concept of function uh, functioning a disability. So ISC model is also known as the International Classification of Functioning, Disability, and Health, or it can also be called Model of Functioning and Disability. Really what you need to know is that the ICF model is going to be divided into two parts. Part one is going to be functioning and disability. So basically, are they able to perform certain tasks and are they able to participate in these certain tasks? Functioning can be referred to the positive interactions, the integrity of body function and structures, and the ability to perform activities and partake in life situations. While disability is a negative interaction with health situations, so basically the impairments in the body function and structures, the activity limitations, and participation restrictions. So similar to what we were saying earlier, basically enablement and disability, not disability, what's it called disability? Yeah, disablement, sorry, model. Basically the same thing, but let's take it up a fact, or a notch, sorry, English. <laughs> Part two is like, okay, cool, but let's actually know some contextual factors. People are not defined by their health condition. Let's again re uh, revisit that example of the guy with the spinal cord injury. He's not just a guy who's like, oh, he can't walk on um, a wheelchair. Maybe he's the father of two. Maybe he has a loving wife of 20 years, you know? There's more to that than his condition and how can that affect it and why we need to implicate it in this model. And we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. So again, contextual factors, and this is going to represent the background of an individual's life and their living situation. So when we talk about contextual factors, other than that like wacky example I used, uh, they can be environmental or personal. Environmental factors are things that are going to be external to the individual, and personal factors are going to be those unique features or characteristics of the individual. So environmental, I... I... 
live on the hundredth floor of an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> and personal like I'm a gamer <laughs> I I use my hands for the controllers and fine movement <laughs> and all that jazz <laughs> well you sound like better examples but I just want to see if I can make it relatable uh the data says your model streety yes uh da -da -da. Uh, these contextual factors may either facilitate or hinder an individual's ability to perform activities and participate in society. So if we had to really sum it up, this is the screenshot of the ICF model. So we have the health condition, and from their health condition, we're going to see how does that affect the body structure and function? How does that affect the activity? How does that affect their participation? And from these three, what environmental factors and personal factors are going to be involved? And as you see, there's double-sided arrows, so this can kind of flow no matter what way. Environmental and personal factors can come back up and go back into the activity, which can go here, go here. As long as you kind of address all these, you're good. There's really not a certain order. So let's actually break each one down to what they are, define them, and see if we can put an example to them. So the IFC model, let's begin with the health condition. So this is basically your medical diagnosis. So this can be acute or chronic diseases, disorders, injuries, or circumstances that have an impact on individual functioning. So what this means is that, uh, the ten tendonitis, no, the tendonitis, and that rotator cuff, that can be a disorder. Or maybe you have frozen shoulder, or maybe you have low back pain. Maybe you have carpal tunnel syndrome. All of that can fit into the category of health conditions. From there, we can go back, or not go back, we could go forward now, and to body structure and function, activity and participation. So for body function and structure, the function is going to be the physiology physiological function of the body while the body structure is anatomical uh, parts of the body main difference is basically body function are you able to do certain things do you have weakness do you have a limited range of motion like what's going on while the structure is more like a, a is there any like swelling maybe you're an amputee what is it exactly and how we can classify you in this model so we can also kind of do a side note and talk about impairment so i kind of talked about it uh, kind of overlapped with the examples i was using with like amputee because that is technically an impairment but impairment is going to be the loss of integrity of a body function or structure so some examples we can have for body structures that Again, maybe you have some joint swelling, muscle spasms, scarring, wound, or amputation. While body function is going to be like pain, reduced sensation, decreased range of motion, decreased strength, power, endurance, impaired and balance, coordination, poor posture, and decreased aerobic capacity. Huh? Would range of motion not be anatomical? Uh, and, uh, it's... How do, you, how do you say it? How, how do I define it? I, it's still more categorized under uh, body function. Uh, range, uh, anatomical or like the structure is more like the actual body part itself, if that makes sense. While uh, function is just more general, <laughs> as you can see from these like examples here. Hope that helps question mark. <laughs> Sorry, I, I feel like I should explain it better because I'm a big advocate of if you can teach it and if you can use examples, then you know it. And I'm just like, ah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh my goodness. But yeah, body structure, actual like body part, body function, everything else. Can you function? Can you stand? Can you do this? Is there. Things that might be limiting you from doing these certain things, and then if so, that's going to be your impairment. Right? Oh, and then from impairments, we could talk about primary, secondary, and the composite or the tertiary one again, but we already talked about that, so no. Let's talk about activity. 
sorry, it's right up here. So the activity is going to be the execution of a task or action by the individual. These are mostly like smaller, more specific tasks. I think a good way to kind of sum up activity is that it's your INGs. It's your standing, it's your walking, it's your rolling, it's your any anything that you're actively doing. Excuse me. Hi, Pirati. Hi, hi. Welcome. Guess what? Chicken butt. <laughs> what? What happened? <laughs> but welcome, welcome, welcome. Chicken butt. <gasps> That's what I said. <laughs> Hacker. I, I, I don't think I have any chicken emotes, too. I did that. I do! <laughs> anyway, anyway. Welcome! The Papalk? <laughs> Thank you, Robo. So yeah, so basically any of your ING. So activity limitation is going to occur when an individual has difficult executing or is unable to perform task actions or the ADLs, the activities of daily living. So again, some more examples, formal list of activities is going to be reaching, gasping, sorry, grasping, <laughs> throwing, Catchy. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't catch that before. <laughs> you have lifting, lowering, carrying, pushing, pulling, bending, stooping, turning, twisting, rolling, sitting, standing, <laughs> transferring, squatting, kneeling, walking, crawling, running, and ascending or descending stairs. Alright, let's move on to participation. So, participation is going to be similar to an activity, but this is going to be more social. It's going to have involvement in life situations, and it's going to be much larger, large, larger, <laughs> larger, and more broad tasks. So, basically, oh, break, 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 hi, 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 welcome. Long time no see, how are you? Thank you for the self care and the head tat. Hello. Thank you! <laughs> I will sip some water. Hold, 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 hold. hold. <laughs> mm. Dice. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Just studying as you see. <laughs> I hope you've been well. So, uh, for participation restrictions, it's going to be problems with an individual that they may experience when involvement in life situations measured uh, by social standards. So, what does this mean? <laughs> this basically means that they're unable to do things like self-care. So, self-care can be like brushing your hair, washing yourself, etc., etc., your mobility in the community, maybe you're not able to get around, and maybe that you're kind of stuck at home, which, I mean, you're unwilling, unwilling, like you're forced to stay at home, not because you choose to, you weenie. <laughs> Occupational tasks, which kind of goes hand in hand with self-care. School-related tasks, home management indoors and outdoors, so maybe you're not able to go gardening, or maybe you're not able to sweep because maybe... The little dust pan, you're not able to like reach down and get it because maybe some balance issues or maybe it just hurts to like bend down with either your back or maybe your knees, etc. etc. Uh, caring for dependents, that's a participation, and maybe you might have some restriction if you're not able to do that. Let's say maybe you have a child or maybe you are no dependents, yeah, yeah, dependents are children, <laughs> or maybe um, a very frail older person can be a dependent of yours uh recreational and leisure activities maybe you're not able to play pickleball whatever the heck that is <laughs> but i hear a lot of old people say they like pickleball and I, I i still haven't really seen what it is i i guess it's just associated with tennis but it is what it is uh socializing with family and friends and community responsibilities and service so maybe you're like oh i want to clean up i want to help pick up trash in the community uh if you have that restriction you won't be able to do, do that basically <gasps> Hi, Nico. Hi, hi. Welcome. So many long time no sees. Hello. What are we learning? We're, we're learning the concepts of life and how you shouldn't define people by their condition, but also give them contextual factors because they are human. Uh, we're also learning just about movement and learning and all that good stuff. But welcome, welcome. Hope everything's been well with ya. Welcome. <laughs> so, mm, 
We talked about health condition. We talked about body function structure. We talked about activity. Oh, you can't see my mouse. We talked about activity and we talked about participation. So let's actually move on to the environmental factors or the personal factors. So from the environmental factors, we're gonna basically associate that with physical, social, attenuated, what, what is it, that, that word? Environment in which people conduct their lives. So some examples can be ar architectural characteristics. So like I said before, I live on the 100th floor of an apartment. That's architecture <laughs> right there. <laughs> we have weak on social structures. So maybe like socioeconomic status, all that uh, jazz and the climate and terrain so maybe hey maybe they live in florida and it's super hot or maybe they live in alaska and it's super super cold or maybe they live in i don't know what else is an extreme <laughs> chicago maybe they live in chicago and it's super windy <laughs> you know stuff like that we have to consider with the environment and see how that can impact them it's been a while too you doing well i am i have an exam and all that jazz so mentally I have to be big brain <laughs> and make sure I study so that's what I'm doing I'm trying to take the initiative and making sure that I hold myself accountable you know boo being accountable boo responsibilities boo <laughs> bye gotta hi Jad hi hi welcome thank you for the head pat I'm so sorry it wasn't like thank you thank you thank you but I appreciate you thank you thank you thank you thank you <laughs> Lim says is I am under the water, please help me in architectural characteristics. Uh, that sounds like an emergency. Ain't you call 911 or anyone else who, uh, if you're not in America, whatever else is your emergency contact for the police, fire department, or medical services. <laughs> I don't know if you also have heard that, uh, like when you call a place and it's like, if this is a medical emergency, please call 911. <laughs> that's a, that's a 911 thing. <laughs> I heard cannibal? Definitely not cannibal. Definitely did not say that. <laughs> or a climate terrain? True. I, I guess if you're underwater, that is the terrain I'm in. I am under the water. <laughs> anyway, and then we also have some personal factors that we should uh, keep in mind, such as like race, gender, family background, and coping styles. So I learned, but I've heard this so many times before. Uh, but I forgot the disorder because my brain is so dumb. Like, older white women are, like, prone, I think are more prone to osteoporosis, which is, like, a weakening of the bones. So race can definitely have a play of, like, what you may be more prone to. Uh, gender as well. Sometimes males may have a more likely outcome of this certain disease more than the females or vice versa. Family background. Are, are you rich? <laughs> are you, are you, are you poor? Are you, are you barely making it? <laughs> <laughs> you know stuff like that and coping styles because that actually kind of plays a part too of like how your motivation is yeah we won't get into that <laughs> i'm still coping <laughs> give me the copium <laughs> we also have education professional um not professionalism professional past or current experience your overall fitness and your psychological assets that's all pretty much like self-explanatory though but yeah, we went over the whole IFC model, so let's see if I can remember from memory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have like health condition, which goes to body structure and function. Then we have activity, then we have participation, and then we have environmental and personal factors that- or contextual factors? No, personal factors that we have to analyze because it goes under like the category of contextual factors. Bam! I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway. So, uh, this organization, the APTA's patient client uh, management model, is a uh, itinerative process that focuses on the needs of an individual. It's compromised of six elements. So, we have the examination, evaluation, diagnosis, prognosis, intervention, and outcomes. That's gonna bother me. <laughs> So here's kind of like a wink, a, a winky, a wink, <laughs> a wonky photo. So here's this in photo form. So let's talk about the examination. So the examination is going to be your first step in this patient client management process. The reason why we have this, uh, by the way, from my memory, oh goodness, is that 
we should take more initiative, I suppose, as a profession to basically take care of our clients. <laughs> so let's start with the examination. What the heck is wrong with my patient? <laughs> Let's take a history, let's do a, system, a systems review, and let's do some tests and measures. So a history can be defined as a, system, a systematic gathering of past and present data. So the history can really vary, holy heck, let's actually talk about this and go through it. So your history can be and like your demographics, social history, employment, work history, growth, development, living environment, general health status, social and health habits, family history, medical history, current complaints, functional goals, medications, and other clinical tests. This is super, super important. Really, this is all information that you're going to gather from the individual, their significant other, or a caregiver. And basically, you're going to consult with the fellow team members, and you can also gather this information from uh, surveys or questionnaires that you may give to them. Like... I think a very common one, like when you go to a doctor, it's like, hey, are you taking any <laughs> Are you taking any medications? Are you pregnant? Are you uh, smoking? How how often do you exercise? You know, stuff like that is very important because that's gonna play a part of like how or maybe more why you may be there. For example, what if I was a construction worker and I did a lot of heavy lifting and I just was going too quick and I didn't use proper proper, <laughs> proper body mechanics and you know, I'm like, oh, my back. And it's like, oh yeah, well you kind of do do a, he a lot of heavy lifting as, construct as a construction worker. This and this, this may play a part of it. Oh, also you take care of like your older mother, so now you have like a dependent and all this other stuff and it's just again humanizing that person. <laughs> Bring into people's homes like they do in a doctor's house? Wait, what do you mean? <laughs> I will never break into anyone's home. Never. But yeah, basically gathering this uh, history in the examination process. Because remember, the stuff that we're still on is examination. But we have the subcategory of gathering their history. Is that we're basically conducting an interview. We want to understand who our patient is and their chief complaints. And we're going to basically ask questions that are going to help explore their life. Because I'm not really there to hear their life story. <laughs> <laughs> but we're gonna try to get as close as we can in a very medical uh, POV. <laughs> uh, a snapshot, if you would, basically. We're gonna be doing the enablement perspective, which again, enablement model that we are talking about earlier. How, how are they able to participate in their life? And basically identify that participation participation and role of the patient and what outcomes they have to do to be able to go back to work or fulfill a role that they had previously uh, before this a uh, problem uh we can also use the disablement perspective and basically analyze the disease or pathology so hey maybe they're just flat out not able to do this anymore again let's use the construction worker example maybe i just smashed my hand my hand is just so I can't write anymore and that's basically a disability because maybe it was my right hand and I'm right handed and oh boy does that suck. <laughs> but it happens. It does happen. Hi Garland. Hi hi welcome. Tiffany why is your new outfit so cute? <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna be so sad when October's over. I'm gonna change my hairstyle to this. <laughs> I'm rebranding to a new hairstyle. Sorry Cubs. <laughs> No, but I like my other one too. Heck. <laughs> you want to see a ref? <laughs> it's um mm, I I will try my my um uh outfit's a little wonky to be honest. I I can give you the world's quickest preview. You ready? You ready? Ready? Wah. <laughs> go 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 man. Go man. <laughs> I see legs. I would hope you would. <laughs> but what happens is that my hand is stuck in this, like, okay, sorry. The hands on the desk are real. My hand is like, it, 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 it looks like a puppet. And I want to know where this puppet hand is coming from. 
So I'm like really like upset. <laughs> so that's why I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, full body reference. Or I was too shy. Because <laughs> I have no idea how to unfreeze my hands. <laughs> I'm insecure. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. The sound really adds on to it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop. I have no idea where my model was. <laughs> where am I? Who am I? <laughs> thigh highs low? I always had thigh highs low. <laughs> I always had them. Always. <laughs> They're my go to. They're comfy and easy to wear. <laughs> ah, okay. I had fun for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let's talk about the system review though. So we're going to talk about screening of the body systems and basically get a comparison and general overview of the patient. So when we talk about body systems, we're going to rule out certain things uh, and see what's okay, what's not okay, and what area we need to focus on in particular. So we need to decide also like, hey, is this kind of out of our scope of practice? As this person has experienced something as severe as like cancer or maybe they have like some kind of tumor or all that that's definitely out of the scope of what a bear cat can do unfortunately so we may need to refer them to an outside source who's definitely way more knowledgeable they are fire designs as usual thank you i am i don't know i uh i really wanted to do an off the shoulders look for a very long time but <laughs> i i was i was a coward i also don't know how to self shade so <laughs> So I tried my best looking or going clothes shopping for this outfit. <laughs> but I'm glad it came out well. I'm glad of all like the positive feedback that I've been getting. So thank you, every cop. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So we talked about history. We talked about systems review. So let's talk about the test and measures. So basically, it's going to be really important to do this because it's going to establish a baseline for us. If we're going to continue... Eh, treatment with this patient it's important to have this baseline because at the end of their session we want to see hey did they improve or hey they did not improve and they did actually worse and you should feel bad <laughs> you want to look for improvement though 100 percent aye aye <laughs> so there's a thing we can do called movement analysis so we can ask the patient to move a certain way and see if there's any deviation with that years ago no it's not years ago but last year we did talk about like the gait cycle and whatnot and we can have them walk and be like hey how are they walking <gasps> cops that brings me to like a really weird story not really so basically after you know the whole gait cycle gait if for those unfamiliar with it's just how you walk i i went out this past weekend i think <laughs> Yeah, I guess I did, yeah. Uh, sorry, it's not like I was partying hard. It's just my memory's bad. And um, there was someone who was walking, but they were walking like they had duck feet. And that's not an insult to them whatsoever. But you know when you walk, your toes are normally pointed forward, right? Well, their toes were pointed out to the side, and it was both their feet. So, like, if you put your hands together, and then you put your hands to make like a V, that's how they were walking and it made me think like, why are they walking like that? Do they have pain? Is it like a weird body structure? Maybe they, they're like, they're really externally rotated. Do they have a weird, a weird, do they have a weak glute max that's putting them or a tight gluteus maximus, which is pulling them to external rotation? And that's why they're like, toes are out? What's happening? We won't really know until we do more particular tests, but that's why movement analysis is very important to, you know, uh, analyze. We can also do specific tests and measures, so basically we could confirm or deny a hypothesis like, hey, we're testing for neck pain and this person does not have neck pain? Oh. Okay, roll that out then. Alright, let's give them the back test. Let's see this, let's see that. You know, all the other really cool stuff. We can also see about outcome measures. So that's going to be the functional outcome measures that's going to assess the extent of the impairment, the activity limitation, and participation restriction. So again, using that example earlier about, hey, can you reach... Can, how, do, how do you say it? Can you touch your back? And both hands touch your fingertips while back there can you externally rotate your arms to make sure that your fingers touch your back i i i, I don't know i'm so sorry i'm not good with writing <laughs> anyway so let's move on so remember we're only on step one out of six our next step after that because we want to really <gasps> oh, 
What? <gasps> Hello, good night, everyone. Hello, Cone. Hi, hi. Good night. And to get us dreams, thank you for stopping by. Thank you for the tier two stuff for 25 whole hecky months. That's a quarter of a everything. <laughs> Welcome, welcome. Thank you for your continued support. I appreciate it. Very, 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 very much. Welcome! But good night. <laughs> May the soothing voice of Rainy Coffee Shop put you to sleep. Z, 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 z. <laughs> Man, maybe I should have put the stream a little bit later. So I z, 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 z. I hope you've been doing well and all that jazz, okay? Thank you again for stopping by. <laughs> Sorry not to keep shooing you off. I'm just like, no, I forget. I think we're like a 12 hour difference, so it's super late for you. So, heck. <laughs> mm. Sorry, sorry. Anyway, uh, yes, 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 yes. So, uh, uh, yes, uh, patient, patient slash client management model. Step one was. Examination! <laughs> Active recall, let's go! <laughs> Where we had the history, the system reviews, and the test and outcome. So let's talk about evaluation. So now that we're done with the examination process, moving on to our second step, evaluation, it's gonna help interpret, inter, interpret, I feel like I'm saying that word, interpret. <laughs> <laughs> the data collected in the examination portion. We're gonna interpret the response to tests and measurements. We're gonna do the. Uh, we're gonna integrate the data with information collected in history. We're gonna help determine what is their problem. So determine their diagnosis, and we're gonna determine their prognosis. If you're unfamiliar with the term prognosis, it's basically how likely they are to recover. Huh? I'm only one hour behind the stream. Ah, really? I thought you were 12 hours! <laughs> no! I for I'm sorry. I forgot. <laughs> oh man. Good night. Oh yeah, Sumi! <laughs> I don't know why in my head, maybe. Huh. I feel dumb now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> mm. But yeah. Uh, and then uh, from there, when we determine a diagnosis and a prognosis, by the way, we're going to determine POC, or a plan of care, and basically see how we're going to help out this individual to see how we can maximize uh, the, the, best? the best outcome for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So step three, now that we're done with examination and evaluation, we're going to talk about diagnos uh, it, diagnosis and we're going to talk about the diagnostic process, which is going to be the collection of data. We're going to analyze and interpret leading to a working hypothesis because again, we're using our best educated guess with the best evidence that we have available to determine what the patient has. From there, that process is also going to help organize and classify the data into categories. These categories, we can move over here to this side of the chart, is going to help identify and describe patterns or uh, the clusters of the findings. Uh, the purpose of the labels to guide in developing the prognosis, plan of care, and intervention. So, I, 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 I don't know how to, I, I guess a fever again? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so let's say your medical condition is that we determined you have a fever! Yay! Boo, I'm so sorry. So we know the patterns of a fever. Again, you have your high temperature, maybe you're, you're shivering, maybe you're sweating. You're definitely not doing well, but there's some, like, patterns that are very common that everyone or most people experience when they have a fever. From there, we're going to develop the prognosis. Oh, you know, a fever is relatively common. If you rest, if you take medication, if you're going to follow up with this plan of care, I think your prog prognosis will be good if you follow through with these interventions and the interventions being, again, your bed rest medication and making sure you're, you're staying hydrated. Um... The category is going to describe the impact of the health condition on the human movement system. And basically, this category is also going to help indicate the primary dysfunction to be addressed to help that selection of interventions and develop plan of care. So we basically said the same thing like three times over. <laughs> oh, Sunny, hi, hi, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Hi, Tips, do you have the exam already or not? So, my exam, I was supposed to have an exam yesterday or tomorrow, but it got moved for next week, so yay! <laughs> but that's the one I'm going to be studying for Thursday. I do have an exam today, 
so that's why I'm studying for this. I'm going through the study guide that I made, but uh, later I'm meeting up with a classmate to study. It's already 1.39 though. <gasps> Ooh, I need a speed run because I wanted to meet up with them at 3, but I wanted to take a baby break. Oh no. Okay, cubs. I know this is really impromptu. Let me be right back. Hydrate, stretch, and I'm gonna go for a speed run, okay? I'm gonna I'm gonna be wrapping these. <laughs> <laughs> prognosis prediction of the patient's optimal level of function you expect as a result of PT determining accurate prognosis challenging many factors influence prognosis complexity severity acuity credit <laughs> dies okay I'm gonna be right back though Wham. Redemption arc. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I did see that too, and I'm just like. <laughs> but congratulations, Atomic! Ex exclamation mark, question mark. <laughs> Wait, I'll turn it too. <laughs> Alright. So let's speed run. I'll try to do active. Re oh, SG, welcome back. Um, I'll try to do active recall as well. So I took like a, what, a 10 second break? <laughs> So again, patient climate, client management model, that's going to be, again, the examination, evaluation, we talked about, what was the last thing we talked about? Diagnosis. And now we're going to talk about prognosis. Sunny Goddess Redemption Act, what's up? <laughs> I'm sorry. Another one. I'm just going to spam this. I need a win because I think I have like 56 gals. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Alright, so let's talk about prognosis while we wait for this raffle to end. So we talked about it's just a prediction of patient's optimal level of function. That's it. Well, we're going to sum it up because I have to speed run it. Prognosis is basically how likely you are to recover. <gasps> Thank you for the contribution. Well, I never realized I could say SG if it's not GG. What does SG mean? <gasps> yeah, boy! <laughs> um, I never moved from where I was. <laughs> Sad game. Yeah, STST. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I there's tears in my eyes. <laughs> okay, anyway. So intervention. I no one gamble. Everyone's losing today. Do not gamble. <laughs> what the heck? 
<laughs> this is why Twitch is banning gambling. I'm banning Atomic. Look how many gals. <laughs> Sharon is caring. Anyway, sorry. So let's talk about intervention. So intervention is basically we're going to select, prescribe, and interpol implement interventions based on examination data, evaluation, diagnosis, prognosis, and goals. So we have nine categories of how we're going to do intervention. I hope these are not important. I think it is gift points. Let's see. Gift points. <gasps> yeah! Yeah, boy! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> How unfortunate with the raffle. I I'm I'm doing I'm gonna make a YouTube video. <laughs> I'm gonna show my adventures of uh gambling. <laughs> it'll, it'll kinda suck because uh thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Cause my big hat is in the way, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, SG! GG! So I don't know, I'm like clapping with like my pen. Hold on. Okay, so there's nine categories. So we have patient instruction, airway clearance, assistive technology, biophysical agents, functional training, integumentary repair slash protection, manual therapy, motor function training, and therapeutic exercises. That these are all interventions that we can apply to our patient. And then really most important are outcomes. So what is the implementation? What is the results of implementing that plan of care? <gasps> SG, no. SG. <laughs> So let's talk about hypothesis oriented practice involving a uh, hypothesizing, hypothesizing, <laughs> uh, hi, 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 hypothesizing impairments based on movement analysis. So basically, this kind of model or practice is going to hypothesize the cause of abnormal movement. So let me finish the sentence really quick. No, no, no. Let me show you the example really quick, and then we'll talk about the examples. So, hey, let's say we're helping someone up that's having problems with their stability, which is why they're using a walker. They're getting up in a really weird way. When we get up from our chairs, we don't get up this way. Uh, I, I guess we don't even really use a walker, but... Uh, <laughs> excuse me, but if we do, we definitely still don't get up this way. Why is this person leaning towards one side? And why are they leaned over like that? Are they using heavy reliance on the walker to keep themselves stable? What could be wrong? And basically that's what we have to do. We have to hypothesize or give our best educated guess of why is this person having abnormal movement? Is it muscle weakness? Is it stiffness? Is, is it a nerve issue? Is it like, ow, my back feels more comfortable when I'm hunched over? If I'm straightened out like this, and even then this person's not completely straight, like what's happening and so from there we're going to determine the appropriate test or measures to kind of rule in and rule out this hypothesis from there we can talk about mmt's which is your manual muscle testing your gomi or your mlt which is going to be your muscle length testing from there we're going to do clinical decision frameworks which is going to include these four cool things but we're going to actually really just focus on this hypothesis oriented algorithms for clinicians too H-O-A-C-2. So this is just something that I have to define and apply for the test. Like she gave like a heavy focus on this and I'm like, oh. <laughs> so this is kind of in the subcategory of clinical decision making frameworks, which all of this is going to encom encompass the evidence based practice. The really cool thing about the medical field or healthcare in general is that we are using evidence based practice. It is what it sounds like. We are using evidence and saying, hey, does this work? Yes, we have the evidence to prove it. We can implement it. <laughs> and there's new cool things that are happening every day because of technology that's improving and how we can apply that to maybe an intervention for a patient to see if they can get better. Maybe there's a very older traditional way that's always worked, but maybe now there's a newer, faster way that has results in like, less time. That's something we have to um, consider. Ashley, thank you for like a scene a little bit. But yeah, 
For the HOAC2, this is basically going to be the algorithm for planning and evaluating that's going to facilitate the use of science in practice. It's going to describe a series of steps involved in making informed clinical decisions, which is super important. You never want to assume stuff. You want to make sure that if someone's like, I'm here for a headache, you're not like, oh, you're just stressed. Maybe there's much more than that, and that's something to consider. Uh, we're going to incorporate elements of the APTA's guide to practice and basically the hypothesis orientated approach, which is something we just talked about before, that's going to be again creating a list of problems or potential problems and hypothesize as to why that problem may exist. From there, we're going to monitor intervention effects and uh, altering the plan of care as necessary. Maybe something isn't working and that's okay. Sometimes patients are not responding to certain things which is normal maybe you don't respond to a certain medication but you like this other maybe otc or off-the-counter brand a little bit more and you feel like that works stronger these things just kind of happen it's okay to alternate plan of care but that's why you just have to kind of go through the steps and wait it out and see from there and yada 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 anyway so this is another framework right here the integrated framework and that's just going to be using multiple models for clinical reasoning each step poses a hypothesis and collect data to make a review emphasize on the interview which is the history collecting process that we were talking about earlier and we're going to use motor learning theory to inform clinical reasoning which is motor learning theory is something we'll talk about a little bit later um, basically, I need to know the vision statement of APTA, which is basically <laughs> transforming society by optimizing movement to improve the human experience. This vision is going to have eight different things. We're going to have identity, quality, collaboration, value, uh, innovation, consumer centric, access and equity, equi yeah, equity and uh, advocacy so really one of the main things that we need to consider for this vision is our identity we need to define and promote the movement system as our foundation for optimizing movement to improve health of the society yay i didn't stumble through that <laughs> and understanding what the movement system is Yes, we're going to define and promote this, but we're going to define and promote the integration of body systems that generate and maintain movement at all levels of bodily function. It's the core of our practice, education, and research, and this is going to help us because that is what we do, or that's what I'll do, <laughs> which we're going to evaluate and manage an individual's movement system across their lifespan. Heck, all the other ones. <laughs> So let's talk about theories really quick. So while the movement system was being well, the movement system, we needed to understand it, but there was very little understanding, isn't it, that we just move? There's various theories of how we are now, and so we're gonna basically step, um, work our way through of previous theories that we kind of believed in before, and where we are now as a society. <laughs> so. Uh, basically, all these theories have made a specific contribution to the field of motor control. And motor control is basically, again, a fancy way of how we move. So the first theory is reflex theory. Sensation is super important to regulating movement. We don't follow the reflex theory, by the way. This is like the older one that's outdated. Reflexes were the building blocks of behavior, and a complex behavior resulted from reflex training. So what does this mean? Let me read through this and let me see if I could sum it up in like a much easier term, okay? So basically this theory was created by Sir Charles Sherrington in the early 1900s, which is crazy because that's only so recent, you know? It was to recognize the importance of sensory information to regulate in movement. So he believed that the basic structure of a reflex consisted of a receptor, which we see here, then we have a conductor, which are these, and then the effector, which is going to be the muscle. Complex behavior could be explained through the combina or combination, combined action of an individual's reflex that were chained together, aka reflex chaining. So basically this guy is like, hey, we walk because we feel something underneath our feet. That sensory information is going to be uh, going to a receptor, which is going to be conducted through here, and that's why we move. We feel something under our feet, we got that stimulus, we gotta go. Which doesn't explain much, and how do we multitask, and how do we do this, and it, it's really weird. So let's talk about clinical implications and the limitations. 
So for clinical implications, that's going to be reflex testing should predict function. So if change slash compounded movements were the basis of movement, then you need to spend time and understand reflexes because it would predict function. And it would describe movement in terms of presence or the absence of reflexes. And oh, I feel like I'm losing it. Anyway, uh, retain motor control by facilitating or inhibiting effects of uh, various reflexes. So basically, let's see if we could sum this up. So the clinical implication of the reflex theory is that the reflex testing should predict function. Even before we move, we should know, hey, if we always feel this, then this sh should happen, correct? That's obviously not the case. Uh, another clinical implication of reflex theory is to understand that the movement was going to be described or interpreted based on reflexes and that motor retraining would just be enhancing or reducing certain reflexes or stimulus. Limitations, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> So this doesn't really explain any like spontaneous or voluntary movement, you know, like <laughs> it doesn't really explain, uh, what's, what is a good example? I guess just anything, anything voluntary, like, hey, just because you feel something underneath your feet doesn't mean you should move, you know, I can choose to move. But again, that theory didn't really cover that, which sounds really weird because <laughs> I'm I'm pretty sure most movement other than actual reflexes, like, you know, when the doctor hits your knee and then the reflex is like, ah, you kick your leg straight, that's a reflex. But most movement in general is voluntary, so it's such a weird theory, right? <laughs> um, another limitation is that this does not predict movement that occurs in absence of the stimulus. So as we know, we can walk even though we may not have a sensory input that's motivating us to walk. Hey, you might not feel the same kind of ground surface, like, oh, maybe we're walking on pavement. Oh, but now we're walking in grass. That's a different kind of stimulus. Or the absence of stimulus. How would you... Walking on air? <laughs> oh, no, I can't think of a good example for this. How unfortunate. But I understand what it's saying. I just don't know how to, like, regurgitate that information. Our uh, reflex theory also doesn't explain fast movement. So it does not explain sequences of movement that occurs too rapidly to allow for sensory feedback. So don't get me wrong, the brain and our body are fast. They're not that fast. <laughs> you know when someone says duck and you're like, huh? <laughs> you either you do duck or you don't duck. It's that kind of situation. So if you were to duck, it doesn't explain why did you duck? What was that fast movement? <laughs> And then it does not explain various movement responses. So it doesn't explain how a single stimulus can provide varying responses or behavior depending on the context and the descending command. So. Mm. Eh. <laughs> I, I, I guess this is a really dummy example, but let's say, how do you say it? <laughs> let's say warmth. Let's say, ah, oh, you know, this is nice and hot, and I'm cold, I like the warmth, or maybe it's 80 degrees, or maybe the temperature is too hot. That varying stimulus is not really explained in the reflex theory, and also the reflex theory does not really explain any, like, sudden new movement, you know? It does not explain novel movements. Mm. Uh, and the next one we're going to talk about is, uh, here, hit, 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 hit. <laughs> Hi, hi, hierarchy theory, which is gonna be built on the reflex theory, and basically it's really weird because it's organized, it's organized in a weird way. It's organized by top down, where the brain is gonna control all the movements. And though that makes sense, we'll talk about it a little bit more in detail. <laughs> Sunny says my brain lags already. Same, my brain already lags. Ah. Uh, anyway, so. Each success. I can't read it anymore. Hold on. <laughs> Each successfully higher level exerts control over the level below. It's never bottom up control. Your feet can't control your movements. What are you talking about? It's only your brain. That is basically what this theory is saying. And that from this top down, that central nervous system, and we're familiar with our central nervous system being the brain and spine, is going to link together. Um, 
all these contractions of different muscles to produce movement patterns and with this this kind of a uh, together contractions are going to create synergies and basically there's only one command or central command that's going to send out and produce normal synergy but that your brain why is Stephania crying because I don't know how to read but I'm a grad school student so I should know how to read <laughs> That is why I'm crying. <laughs> anyway, um, so this theory is really cool because the implications is that it's going to. <laughs> thank you for that, that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, uh, it may explain presence of abnormal reflective activities after cortical damage, and it's gonna help facilitate normal movement with appropriate set receptive input so for example if we have damage to the brain which god forbid any of that happened to any of you um we can justify that we will not the damage to the brain but we could justify the facilitation of normal movement by uh manual facilitation techniques to promote normal patterns i uh, will talk about neuroplasticity and how your brain is able to adopt <laughs> and be really like really cool on how it's able to basically function even if it may be missing something because of god knows what or like damage or whatever you know uh the only issue with this is that even though everything sounds right it's like yeah your brain does control everything i'm just in a meat suit basically right <laughs> it doesn't explain normal reflective behavior so it doesn't explain the example of stepping on attack with your bare foot you have an immediate withdrawal of the leg which is bottom up control you have a stimulus that you have a sharp object in your foot which is the tack bottom up control your foot's gonna be like ow what the actual heck <laughs> and pull your foot up as a reflex and again that's again not explained in this theory so boo this theory is invalid but da, 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 we're getting there so let's talk about motor program theory so this is going to be our third theory which is going to be central motor pattern or motor programs are activated by sensory stimulus or central processes so basically stereotypical hardwire responses so this could be activated by either a sensory stimulus from the periphery, so our, our peripheral nervous system, so anything that is in the brain or spinal cord, or the CNS, the central nervous system, which is our brain and spinal cord. This is going to involve both top-down and bottom-up control. Movement's going to be possible in the absence of a reflex activity or action, and sensory input is going to be a very important function in modal modality? Oh my gosh. Modulating action. So here's some of clinical expectations. So basically, it kind of does the implication of abnormal movement, which is going to result in abnormalities in the CPG, which I actually don't know what that is. CPG. Ah. <laughs> or higher level motor programs. And that the intervention should focus on retraining movements that are important to a task. However, the limitation for this motor programming is that it's not going to be... It, the central motor program cannot be the only determinative action. So let's say you have two identical commands. They can produce two different outputs. Uh, what can be a good example of that? Maybe walking, running? Hey, I need you to move. You walk or run. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, wait, there's an example. There's an example. Two identical commands or signals send the elbow flexor. So let's say we're doing like a bicep curl are going to produce different movements on whether your arm is resting next to your side or you're holding it out in front of you. Okay. <laughs> the forces of gravity will act differently on the limb and will affect the movement output. Also, if your muscles are fatigued, like if you went out to the gym, you worked really hard and you have sore muscles, similar nervous system commands may yield different results. So the motor concept, motor program concept doesn't take into account that the nervous system must deal with both musculoskeletal and environmental variables to achieving movement. So basically, that's it. You did work out really hard. It's if you have your arms to your side right now and you like bring your hands up to you, like you're doing your little bicep curl, very easy. But if you're sore and you have your arms straight out like a zombie with palms up and you try to like flex, you can say that's a little bit harder. So basically the motor program control theory does not again account for those environmental factors and the gravity and yeah. <laughs> Yay! 
yeah, 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 yeah. Systems Theory, which I think, yeah, that's our last one, no, thank goodness. It's gonna be the most current understanding to what we know and why we move and why we do certain things. So it's, again, reflect the current understanding and interpretation of the nervous system. It's gonna describe the process in which various brain and spinal centers work cooperatively to accommodate the commands, the commands, the demands of movement. It's gonna take in consideration both internal stiffness and external factors such as gravity and movement planning. System theories can be referred to as dynamic theory, dynamic systems theory, or contemporary systems theory. So basically what's going to happen is that your brain and spinal cord or centers are going to work cooperatively to accommodate the demands of the intended movement. It's going to be a distributed model of control. Ah! My space bar! No! Sorry about that. It's going to let the systems interact cooperatively to achieve that movement and it's going to allow for flexibility of motor programs versus stereotypical movements which we were talking about two theories ago uh, that can adapt to the task and the environment and basically this plays into this whole thing about task, individual, and environment which we're going to talk about way more in detail I think just a few pages down. So there's currently no limitations for this. Again, this is our current understanding of our bodies. The implications that we're going to know about the system theory is that it's going to focus on the individual system and interaction of multiple systems. This theory is going to stress the importance of understanding the body as a system and the movement is going to be determined by the output of the nervous system filtered through the mechanical system of the body. We're also going to understand that movement is emergent. We're going to understand that the physical and dynamic properties of the human body so we can use this info to help our patients regain motor control because we're movements ever changing, you know? And speaking of those changes, normal movement has variability, so we're going to help encourage flexible movement patterns. So walking, teaching patients how to walk, have them walk forward, have them walk backwards, sidestep. Do it on different terrains. Oh, this is flat and smooth? What if we do something bumpy? What if we have you step over a cone or something like that? And then also, we're going to have them maybe perform dual tasks. Maybe they're walking and then we're going to have them swing their arms at the same time. Really, the goal is to ensure that the patients are able to be independent no matter what they encounter. Yeah, it's cool you could teach them how to walk, but what if they're in a situation that they're not familiar with? Having that variability is going to help them adjust to whatever scenario that they're that they can because our main goal is to help patients gain their independence yay so yeah so now we talk about movement in general now that we're done with the theories which again we could talk about briefly we have your reflex theory which is all just reflex we have your hierarchy theory which is going to be basically top down your motor program which is going to be top down and bottom up but um oops but it can't it, it doesn't account for the environment and the systems theory which is going to account for both internal and external factors bam so easy right so easy haha <laughs> excuse me we talked about movement system already and we talked about the ICF model so we have all that down this is an activity she had us do I'm not gonna go over this because I'm not sure if it's correct and this is more in depth to what we're talking about but with actual like examples and seeing if it caters in there I'm gonna talk to my classmate to see if that's all correct so I don't want to talk about it too much it wasn't speed running so it's okay all right so we had just talked about the theories of systems theory which had talked about briefly about movement emergence and movement being emerged from the interaction of the individual task and environment so let's break these down okay because this is super important this is again our current understanding of why we move how we move etc we need to break it down to the individual that's you <laughs> the individual is going to be that movement emerges through an effort of many different brain structures and processes from the individual we can categorize them into their motor action systems their uh, sensory or perceptual systems and their cognitive systems so motor action systems is basically going to be like your brain your neuromotors such as like the muscles and the joints are going to be moving and your well i guess the brain only plays a certain part in this the brain is everywhere to me <laughs> but no 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 
So your normal uh, motor system, which is going to be your muscles and joints, and we also have your biomechanical, so like your coordination to move. Can you walk and swing? Or like, you know, the really famous example, can you walk and chew bubblegum? Whatever that means. <laughs> For the sensory and perceptual systems, we're going to be talking about the periphery sensory and higher level processing, so basically our ability to understand sensory information. Uh, this higher level cognitive processing is going to translate into something meaningful, and that basically we need to also understand where our body is in space. Where is our body in the environment? If I close my eyes and raise my arms, do I know where my arms are still? <laughs> that that is what proprioception is basically or if i close my eyes and and i lose that sensory input i'm still able to detect where i am in my life and what may be happening <laughs> i think a better term or better summary is like basically where i am in space so we talked about motor action, we talked about sensory, let's move to cognitive. So in the individual, we need to also consider their attention span, their, their planning, their problem solving, their motivation, and the emotional aspect of motor control. I, that sounds a little bit weird, but some people are maybe too afraid to move. Like, hey, this really hurts, I really am not interested in doing it. Or I've done this in the past and this sucks, I don't want to do it. Or maybe motivation plays a part, like, hey, I'm new to this, but I want to get back. My motivation is to get back to what I was doing. Maybe I was playing sports or maybe I was sitting on the computer for like 80 hours at a time. And I like that lifestyle. <laughs> anyway, so that's the individual. We need to consider all these aspects. From there, we're going to talk about the task. So the task is like an errand. Why, why are we moving? <laughs> why are we moving? Because we need to complete a task. So basically, these tasks can be uh, classified to their movement type or their motor requirements. So a task can be either discrete or continuous. Discrete is what it sounds like. It's going to be recognizable be at the beginning to the end. If I am throwing a ball... I know I'm drawing that ball, and that ball's gonna go up into the air. Whoa, look at it go! And then eventually it'll drop. I know that. Sit the stand is a discrete task. I know I'm going to be sitting. I do my actions to get standing. I know at the end I'm standing. Lying down. I know I am standing, and now I want to lay down on my back in my comfy bed. So it's easy, easy. That's all discrete. Continuous is when the performer decides to end. So if you start walking, which is the example we have here, walking, running, swimming, jogging, there's really no recognizable beginning or end. I mean, eventually you have to stop, but who says you have to stop, you know? <laughs> that sounds weird, but no, there's nothing saying you have to stop. But you, as the individual or the performer, gets to decide, hey, maybe I'm going to walk a mile. Or maybe I'll walk less than that. Or maybe I'll walk more than that. You get to decide. Uh, tasks can also be classified as closed or open. So closed are going to be in a fixed or predictable environment with less uh, variability. So basically in a closed uh, task, you could be sitting down by yourself at your desk in a quiet room and an office to study. The environment doesn't change and therefore motor output in your body is very predictable. Yeah, so like right now I'm sitting, I'm talking to you cups. Hi, how's it going? And I'm in a pretty fixed environment. I'm in front of my desk, I'm reading my notes, I'm listening to music. This is what I normally do to study. But if I were to change the task and make it open, it would be more unpredictable and I have to adapt like my movement strategy or or to the changing environment. Maybe there's someone blasting music and I'm like, whoa, 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 that's not my music. What the actual hacky? Who's inconsiderate enough to blast their music? These actual hackers. <laughs> We also, um, some examples of an open task is going to be playing a sport. Your body needs to adapt very really quickly to execute different movement strategies in an environment that's unpredictable and open. Maybe you're playing soccer and you know that your teammate's going to kick the ball to you. Oh boy, how are they going to kick the ball? Where should I be? Should I position myself well? But what about the enemy right there? Is he going to block me? You know, all these things you need to take consideration, but it's something you can't necessarily predict. You can prepare, but you can't predict. Um, your task can also deal with stability versus mobility. So this is actually going to go into three different things. So stability, it's going to be having a non-moving BOS. 
base of support. It's basically going to be a static postural control. So it's basically going to be your ability to maintain your center of mass over your base of support at rest. There's no loss of balance. There's no external support. You are just there, my dude. <laughs> Think of like a T-pose. Or maybe not a T-pose. Um, you're just standing. You don't even have the T-pose. You're just standing. There's no earthquake happening. So your, your uh, base of support, which is going to be the ground, is non-moving. And you're able to uh, keep... I forgot what the body is. Um, <clears throat> I think it's like S2. Like sacrum spine to I, I don't know how to like say it in like easier terms i'm so sorry your sacrum which is like right above your tailbone is sectioned off into five pieces and i think it's the second part of that that is where most of your uh center are masses so if you could keep that over a pose yeah a pose if you a pose over the floor let's go uh basically you have a lot of stability and being able to maintain that pose Maybe again, for example, that A pose for a prolonged period of times is going to be integral. Integral? In integral. Inter integral. Integral. <laughs> anyway. Um, the stability is going to be coming from a lot of your uh, muscle tone and the activity that you have, as well as the control of your proximal segments and your trunk. You know when someone stands still, maybe they're a little bit wobbly, or maybe the better way is like if you're standing on one foot and you know you're trying to move your body to like adjust like oh I really don't want to fall but I'm trying to like stable myself and find my sense of balance that's basically it <clears throat> if you have stability you should have the ability to hold against anti-gravity positions such as prone on your elbows sitting kneeling half kneeling standing etc if you're not able to stabilize yourself you may have failure to maintain a steady body position you may sway a lot like whoa 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 even though you're on your two feet uh, you may have a wide base of support. So that example I was using earlier of the guy who's walking like a penguin. Yeah, there could be a lot of things wrong with this person and how they're walking. But they have a wider base of support. So maybe they're just having trouble standing or walking. And this is how they're coping. Because they're increasing their their whiff. Uh, you could also have a lower center of mass. Which I don't know actually how to lower your center of mass. I know how to make it higher. Like if you raise your arms or if you're like about to go for a dive swimming, you change your center of mass, but I don't remember how to lower it. <laughs> you put your arms down. <laughs> you reach your toes, I think. Is, is that an example? Heck. <laughs> um, you're going to have LOB or loss of balance and you're most likely going to fall. So boo, falling. Right? So let's talk about control mobility. So maybe you have a moving base of support, which is also going to be known as your dynamic postural control. This is going to be your ability to maintain stability, your center of mass over your base of support, while parts of your body are in motion. So this could include weight shifting, maybe, you know, all my waist to, left, to the left leg, now to the right leg. Uh, maybe your limbs moving in anti-gravity position. Maybe when you go reach for something, or maybe when you're like repositioning yourself. And deficits in uh, lack of control mobility, it's going to include failure to control your posture during movement. So when you're walking and swinging your arms, maybe you're like, whoa, that swing of arms is really messing me up. You're going to also have increased sway. So when you move, whoa, and you're also going to have a loss of balance or even potentially fall. So be careful. <laughs> and then regular mobility that's not controlled is basically going to be your ability to move from one position to another safely and independently so your base of support is moving but it's moving because maybe you're trying to perform an action maybe you're going from sit to supine so maybe you're sitting and now you want to lay down on your back that's supine sit to stand rolling transferring from maybe like your bed to your chair or reaching for stuff that's all mobility and it's really important to be sure that you're able to do it safely and independently Deficit in mobility might be failure to initiate or sustain movement through uh, full range of motion. And maybe you just have poor controlled movements. Maybe you're not able to reach for something because you just don't have that coordination, which is fine. Life's fine. Mm. Alright, let me go through. And then we also have manipulation versus non-manipulation. So that's just you changing the um, task up a little bit. Alright. 
Moving on to the last thing in our system theory. So we talked about in individual. We talked about tasks. Now let's talk about environment. The environment is going to include the physical, the psychosocial, and the social environments in which the patient is going to function and live in. Excuse me. The physical environment is going to be important to examine the context in which an action takes place. Movement must match certain spatial and temporal features in the environment to be successful. So, for environmental features, we can um, break it down. We can talk about regulatory features and non-regulatory features. So, regulatory features are going to shape movement. The task must conform to the environment to achieve the goal. <clears throat> So this environment can be a, the size, the shape, the weight, or the type, like a kind of a surface type. Like again, are we on cement, are we on grass, etc. So an example would be the height and the depth of the step you see on the slide that I don't have uh, would shape movement. Or maybe the shape of a cup, height of a stair step, type of flooring, that can all shape the movement. The condition of the environment can be the same or change from one performance to the next. So, uh, I think even you Cubs will recognize this. Like, let's say you're walking on the sidewalk and then you decide to walk on the grass because maybe there's like this inconsiderate like group of friends and they're just walking and there's like four in a row, but the sidewalk really fits too. So you're confused of how they're even walking, <laughs> but you're like, oh, they're not moving and I need to get around them. So I need to walk on the grass. So you walk in that solid surface to the grass, which is definitely an uneven surface. That's going to be a regulatory feature. That's going to help shape your movement. You're going to have to adjust little by little to be like, okay, this is not a solid ground and I need to mentally be taking notes of like, hey, there's a divot or maybe I have to move around certain things. Maybe there's an anthill. Maybe there's a hole. I have to be careful. Uh, Non-regulatory features though... <laughs> <laughs> may affect but does not shape the movement so we can have background noise or the presence of distractions maybe you hear like a baby crying and you're like ah oh. <laughs> uh, things in the environment that are going on but are not really not going to necessarily affect your movement yeah it might distract you but it's not going to be like oh I'm wobbling now because I hear a baby crying <laughs> far too relatable <laughs> so this is actually like a funny side story and I'm, I'm sorry to all the guys in my chat. <laughs> so uh, there was this like funny thing going around where it's like, yeah, you know, anytime someone's walking like in a hallway or on the side or whatever, uh, women tend to move out of the way than men. Like in, in America, because I know other countries might walk different ways. You're like designated to the right. Hi, Tobinatic. Hi, hi. Uh, we're learning about movement, but I'm just doing like a really dumb example, so please forgive me. But I hope everything's super well. How are you? <laughs> so, in America, we stay on the right for a lot of things. Like if we're walking and then we're in a narrow hallway, everyone stays to the right. Sometimes, uh, uh, guys in particular will be on the wrong side, and I'll be walking, and I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna just keep walking. I, this is my right away. Why is this guy here? <laughs> so there's actually a few shoulders that I've almost like bumped into because the guy was refusing to move and I was refusing to move and I'm like I hate it here <laughs> but a lot of times when you get close enough they're like oh my bad like they weren't paying attention I'm just like okay <laughs> or when there is a group of people and then that group doesn't like shimmy in I'm like where am I supposed to shimmy am I supposed to pause and be like here you go my your majesty please pass through me ah I hate it I hate inconsiderate people basically <laughs> it's really not that serious because I I don't really deal with those scenarios I'm I'm a homebody but when I do deal with it it's just like uh. <laughs> anyway so an example of what we can do to combine both our task our uh, environment and our individual is let's say uh, there's a 10 year old who's walking down an empty hallway they can do it i believe in them but now let's put them in a scenario where this 10 year old is walking down a busy hallway holding a large object <laughs> so they are they are they are definitely uh at more of a disadvantage than they were when they were just walking down the regular hallway they need to adapt in certain ways and adjust their movements in certain ways to make sure they're able to get down that hallway Tip is taking a stand against people walking on the wrong side of the sidewalk. I am! <laughs> it's so annoying. 
I feel really bad because um, when I was going to Japan, their default is actually the left. So I'm like, oh, my bad. Oh, my bad. Oh, my bad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm like, Aijin, sorry. <laughs> Please forgive me. I'm new here. <laughs> but yeah, whenever like three or four people form a moving wall, just moving down to the sidewalk is just where it is. Oh, we. <laughs> I I vote next time that happens, real, but we just like link arms or something and just be like, we are a wall now. <laughs> Intimidate them, you know? <laughs> anyway. So, uh, let's talk about. Uh, we talked about the features of the environment. Let's talk about variability really quick as well. So, variability, you're gonna have either inter trial variability or no variability whatsoever. Inner trial is going to refer to the movements going to be modified each time. While no variability means that this movement does not change. So, I think even before I define it, or I did define it, heck, my memory is so short, you do have to modify each time it's performed. So, let's say you're walking up a mountain. Maybe this area is a little bit more steep. This area is not as steep. This area is steep. You have to adjust your movement each and every time. Or maybe you have like steps that are different heights. Yeah, this one was small and tiny, but now this one's like three feet up the ground. Like, huh? What? <laughs> when no variability, it's basically what it sounds like. It's basically, it's the same. There's no variability with it. There's no changes. All the steps on the stairs are the same. You cannot mess it up. Nothing's going to heck you up. Gotcha. And so that's some of the variability. Um, The study guide goes over grasp. Which I'm not really sure how to explain other than GG, go reach. <laughs> Locating a target is gonna have eye head uh, coordination of eye head movements, which is like, oh, I want to grab this, I will grab it. Reaching and grasping. I, I don't know, like these PowerPoints do not help me. I have a general idea of how to do this. <laughs> I do this every day in my life. <laughs> um. Controller reach and grasp, sensory and motor systems, so the visual system of what and where. We have the somatosensory, which is going to help us with fine regulation and control the grip force. So if we're maybe like grabbing a button, you know, we do a little pinch grip and be like, oh, I'm going to get it. Versus like a volleyball, we're just like, oh, let me grab that bad boy. <laughs> and our musculoskeletal system, do we have the range to like move our arm across? Do we have the strength for control to do this task? Do we have the coordination or even the posture? The world may never know. So we have like the power grip and we have the precision grip. The precision grip is literally what I was just describing with the um, button or you could do it to like hold a pen. While the power grip is basically going to be like what you see here, grabbing a ball or grabbing like a baseball with one hand. Uh, there's four phases of the grass and lift task. So we can lift. The lift starts with the contact between the fingers and object. The grip force and the load force increase. The load force overcomes the weight of the object and it starts to move. And then at the end of the task, there's a decrease in the grip and load force. This is so boring. Ah! <laughs> why do I know? Why do I need to know like how to do it? I mean, I get it, but still. Anyway. Uh, let's move on to a law. So this is going to be Fitt's law. Fitt's law is going to express the relationship between movement time, distance, accuracy, and stating when the demands for accuracy increase. Wait, and stating that when the demand of accuracy increases, movement time will also increase. So this was something from the PowerPoint. It says whenever our movement precision is increased or the movement distance is increased, the movement time becomes longer. So, the equation describes movement time will increase linearly with difficulty tasks or task difficulty. Example, if you reach for a small object like the button, it will take longer than reaching for something larger like a softball. Movement times increase with... <laughs> it will take you longer to reach for an object that's further away. Bam! Easy, peasy, lemon, squeezy. <laughs> I don't think that's what it wanted me to know, but that's fine. Uh, let's see if we can finish up with practice and feedback. Actually, I think I think we can get through all of it. Uh, the pages look long, but it's just a lot of images as you see. 
So let's talk about learning really quick, and then our study stream could be over, and then I get something to eat, and then I do this all over again with my classmates. What the heck? So practice and feedback, that's going to be for optimal motor learning. Motor learning, by the way, is something we were talking about earlier, and that's even the motor programming theory kind of goes hand in hand with motor learning. But motor learning is going to refer to the relative permanent change that's going to happen over time. For optimal motor learning, to have the ability to move and know how to do it in a relatively permanent way, um, practice and feedback are going to vary and it depends on what you use and how we're going to keep encouraging that behavior. When we're learning something for the first time or doing a task, we want to keep it simple and consistent. And then afterwards, when we're more familiar with it, then we want to progress to a more varied and random kind of eh, way. That's honestly how we learn. You know how you use flashcards? And you know it in order. Like, okay, A, B, C, D, E. But then when you use varied and random, it's like, okay, but what's the 12th letter of the alphabet? You're like, oh, well, you know, you know, I know the alphabet, but y y y you know. <laughs> Something like that, you know? Anyway, so when we talk about feedback, feedback is basically... <laughs> criticism i guess I don't, I don't know how they say it uh feedback initially is immediate progressing to more faded and less often so when we're learning something maybe from someone who's more of an expert they're more likely to be like hey 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 wait not like this not like this do it like this and then the more you progress and the more you get better their feedback comes less and less and less uh frequent uh, extrinsic feedback may improve motor performance but can slow down motor learning because obviously when you have someone interrupting you, it's kind of like, oh, but wait, 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 but I was in my groove, but you're saying it's not like this? Oh, okay, I'll do it like this then. But you're still adjusting to the way that they want you to do it, which is why it can slow down motor learning. And if you continually provide feedback, by the way, the learner is going to rely on you and not in the intris intrinsic feedback, which is like the self-reflection. They're not going to realize anything is wrong because they've been depending on you to be like, hey, this is wrong. <laughs> and different types of feedback may affect motor performance and motor learning differently, which is something we'll talk and define a little bit later. <gasps> but Paige, hi, hi, welcome, welcome. Hello. Yeah. Ta-da. Halloween! Uh. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Happy Halloween or spooky month to you. Welcome, welcome. We're just studying, so please forgive me. <laughs> so let's talk about the types of feedback. So we can have intrinsic feedback and extrinsic feedback. Intrinsic feedback, again, is going to be that self-reflection. It's going to be the individual's own internal uh, sensory information from whether like, you get like tactile cues, uh, or uh, proprioception, visual, vestibular, or auditory receptors, while external is going to be given by someone else, or like a therapist such as tactile, visual, or verbal. Tactile, by the way, is like when someone moves you to do something, or they're like, hey, your, um, your shoulders are too high for whatever reason, tap, and then they tap it down, like you need to relax and lower your shoulders, and they'll tap the shoulders, that's going to be your tactile cue. Your visual is that they'll show you how to do it, and the verbal is they'll explain how to do it. Vestibular is going with the balance. Like, whoa, I'm standing on one leg, or oh no, I'm losing my sense of balance. How can I do that internal feedback to regain that balance? And auditory receptors, again, is just kind of going almost hand in hand with that verbal of hearing what this other person has to say. Or maybe you're doing something incorrect, and it's like, oh, brah, and it's like, okay, that's the wrong noise. I want the right noise. <laughs> I put on my study glasses, I need to do that. Bam! Study glasses on! <laughs> so, internal feedback, external feedback. Intrinsic feedback, extrinsic feedback. Extrinsic feedback can do progression. So, when someone is teaching you something, there's different ways, uh, different categories of these feedbacks. So, we can have task performance feedback, movement outcome feedback, and just general feedback. So the task performance feedback is going to be concurrent or terminal. Concurrent feedback is going to be given during the task uh, performance. When they're coloring something, it's like, oh, we want you to color the penguin blue. Why are you coloring it purple? Can you fix it? Terminal feedback is going to be given at the end of the task performance. Like, hey, you know, good job, you know, doing what you did. Thank you for coloring that penguin. But we really wanted that penguin to be blue, not purple. <laughs> 
Uh, movement outcome feedback. So knowledge of performance is going to be feedback related to the movement pattern used to achieve the movement outcome. So maybe they're moving in a certain way and you want them to adjust. So it's like, hey, I see you're doing this and while you're doing this, can you actually try this instead? And they do it during that process. Well, knowledge of results, it's going to be the same thing, but at the end. See, these are relatively straightforward processes. So thank goodness, right? But let's talk about general feedback now. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Sorry about that. Actually, let me also sip water. Hold on. I'm almost done. I'm going to reward myself with water. <laughs> Alright, I'm hydrated, I'm good. So general feedback, so we have five. So we have immediate feedback, which is gonna give immediately after a movement. <gasps> hi boo, hi hi. Have good water? I am having the best water. <laughs> hi boo, hi hi. Hope everything's well with you, I'm just like, ah. <laughs> so after immediate, we have delayed feedback, which is gonna provide a brief time delay allowed uh, before giving feedback. So. <laughs> I'm just gonna bring me back to my barista days, so you have to forgive me. So I used to be a trainer at the Bucks of Stars, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and excuse me. And when I would train someone, um, the immediate feedback was given after a movement. I would tell them to steam the milk. But when they steam the milk incorrectly, or they have their a wrong position. Excuse me. I would tell them immediately, like, hey, no do it like this delayed feedback however I'll have them steam the milk and I'm like hey you are doing that process correctly but you can do it like this because then it's it, we go and oh my gosh we talk about like optimizing and what what is what is the word that we use sequencing to better sequence this is how you should do this and this and this and this and this they were really strong on sequencing to help make sure that you're making like multiple drinks at once because especially when you deal with a lot of new people they're like i'm going to stare at this one drink being made i'm like no 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 make the second drink while you're out there <laughs> train at what bucks of stars <laughs> anyway uh just reverse it <laughs> um so so that's the late feedback so it's like hey you did this good job doing this but do this instead summary feedback summary feedback is feedback after a set number of trials so i i'll have to make a few drinks and be like okay well this drink you could have made better in this way while this was while the milk was being steamed you could have started a cold drink something dummy like that <laughs> Faded feedback is going to be feedback given less frequently with ongoing prox uh, practice. So I'm not actively giving this feedback immediately after or delayed. I'm going to try to make it less often. So again, it's to help promote their motor learning to make sure like, hey, they know how to do the task. They practice enough. Let them see if they can do it. And I will give feedback when I, when I need to do it because they're still relatively new. Now, bandwidth feedback. This is feedback given only if the performance falls outside a predetermined error range. So let's say that someone was making a mocha frappuccino. <laughs> a, a mocha frappuccino, but they start putting caramel. I'll be like, wait, what the heck are you doing? And they're like, oh, I read this wrong. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> Re remake it. <laughs> and that is like the each example of the general feedback. So again, we have our immediate, delayed, summary, faded and bandwidth so from there let's learn how to learn things so when we're practicing something for the first time we can uh progress in certain ways so for practice progression it can be this it can be categorized as mass practice or distributed practice mass practice is going to be practice time versus rest while distributed practice is going to be more rest time versus practice so mass practice kind of is what it sounds like it's massive you are mostly practicing and doing like the bulk of what you need to be doing rather than resting so me i'm mass practicing studying i think i took one little break to like stand up and stretch and try to speed run this but i'm doing mass practice which is going to allow me 
to uh, try to get as much more information than I would in a distributed practice because as we define mass practice, it's going to be a session in which the amount of practice time in a trial is greater than the amount of rest between trials. And of course, obviously, this can be overwhelming and it can lead to fatigue in some trials. What if you're trying to like run a marathon? It's like, keep running, keep running, run miles and miles and miles and take like a minute break. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, that's so exhausting. While distributed practice, again, it's going to be more rest time than practice. A session in which the amount of rest between trials is equal to or greater than the amount of time for a trial. And really, depending on which one can be chosen, like, it, it doesn't necessarily matter. It kind of depends on the individual. But as they progress a little bit more, you want to do mass practice. Mass practice is going to go hand in hand with the autonomous stage, which is something we're going to talk about a little bit later. Autonomous is basically meaning that they're going to be independent and that they're able to, uh, how do you say it? Able to do it almost basically error free. Huh? What kind of context is this stuff in? Sports training? And yeah, basically movement science, kinesiology, all that stuff. I just use sports because it's much more like easier to think about. But I, I feel bad because it's kind of like, oh, you're getting to a movement specialty and you don't even like watch sports or into it. I'm like, I know, please forgive me. <laughs> I just really wanted to help my gamer friends and my gamer cubs, my gamers with their wrist problems and back problems. I, I love the typical office worker. <laughs> Anyway, let me see. <gasps> oh my goodness! My friend helped me. Thank you, thank you, classmate. The um, they just responded because remember that study guide or the activity? I was like, I don't know if this is right. They're like, you're the answers. I'm like, ah, <gasps> pog. <laughs> anyway, so with practice, and when you're learning something for the first time, there's two different categories of how to do stuff. So we can have a constant or a variable. So constant, it's going to be when a task is practiced in the same way with no variety. Hey, write the letter T. Write the letter T. Write the letter T. Write the letter T. One line? One line. Keep doing that. Keep doing that. Well, once you're comfortable and more familiar with that, we want to eventually change a person to a variable or a variable practice. And variable is going to be that the task is practiced in variable conditions and parameters. Hey, can you write this T while standing? Can you write this T in cursive? Can you, you know, stuff like that. Variety. <laughs> so, another way the practice can be classified is that we could do either blocked or random. So blocked is basically doing the same task repeated throughout the whole process or the whole practice time. So let's do like exercise. Hey, I'm doing arm day today. Oh, look at me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm going to just do 500 bicep curls and call it a day. Or you can do a random and random is going to be a variety of tasks that are practiced during the um, practice time. So, okay, I'm going to work my, my biceps and triceps <laughs> and maybe I'll do a plank in there too. <laughs> Stuff like that. It's a little silly to explain in concept, but it's really important because, again, you want people to be comfortable in a constant or block, but you want to progress them eventually because you want to promote that motor learning to make sure that they're able to do it independently and do it un autonomously. <laughs> yeah. So here's like an image that we can review again. So we need to talk about the stages of motor learning still, but it basically goes from like, how do you say it? bad to good so you have a cognitive stage associated stage and autonomous stage which is something we want to try doing you could have a practice schedule which is going to be the mass it could be either of these schedules right here mass distributed constant block part-time whole task distribute uh mass again um oh my gosh mass being the more practice time distributed being that they get rest con i don't i i, I don't know how else i'm so sorry you have three different practice uh, schedules and then you have your feedback schedule. So you have your intrinsic again, which is that self-reflection. And then you have the intrinsic, which again is going to be what you might be hearing from like, I don't know, an outside source or like your uh, clinician. So we have your concurrent, which is happening at it. Or we can have the feedback at the end. 
we have the knowledge of performance which is going to be how you're at, how you're doing at that time of the performance and knowledge of the results which is going to be like hey you did great sweetie here are the results of your performance and then from there we could do the immediate feedback beta feedback which again not as often summary feedback they do a few and then you give them feedback on what that is and then bandwidth only give them feedback if they're absolutely wrong so this kind of goes into feedback again uh, let's see what type of feedback should be applied so we have mm, hold on no no this will still be good to go over so feedback what type of feedback should be employed so we have again your intrinsic versus your extrinsic Intrinsic feedback is going to be your proprioception, your visual, your vestibular, the cutaneous or the skin signals that you may be having inside. Like, hey, this doesn't, this doesn't feel necessarily right. Let me address because of all these other inputs that I'm getting. Bow bow. Bow bow. I said bow bow instead of cow cow. Where, where, where am I? <laughs> Adrian Brownie 10, thank you so very much for the follow. Welcome to the cow club. Welcome. Welcome, 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 welcome. But yeah. So we have the intrinsic from there versus extrinsic. And extrinsic, again, that's going to be your clinician talking to you, giving you that feedback, whether it's auditory or verbal cues, tactile or manual cues, or visual. Maybe they'll do a mirror and it's like, hey, you see how your posture is? Can you straighten up? And maybe sometimes people will posture like, my posture is good, yada, yada, yada. But you put them or give them a mirror and you put it to the side and it's like, oh, I, I am probably like hunching a little bit. Let me fix that. Then you have EMG, force plates, etc. Those are other visual cues that may help and give that extrinsic feedback. The type of other feedback we can do again is knowledge of results, feedback about the movement outcome, nature of the, uh, or, or, yeah, nature, I was gonna say natural, nature of the end result, and it's always terminal. Or we can do knowledge of performance. So again, this is feedback related to the quality of movement pattern, which is going to be concurrent or terminal. So knowledge of performance, I didn't realize, can be concurrent or terminal, which means that it can be happening at the same time. Well, knowledge of results as well. The results, it's always going to be terminal. When should the feedback be given? So again it could be concurrent which is when the feedback is given during the task performance again oh you're not steaming this milk right do it like this versus terminal which is going to be the feedback is given at the end hey you could have done this better you could do immediate feedback which is going to be after the movement like oh good job jumping <laughs> or, or maybe let's do this stepping over that cone <laughs> but do this or a delayed feedback which is again they do the task for a little bit and then be like, oh, remember when you were back here? This is what you could have done. By the way, secretly taking a picture of them might be more effective than giving them a mirror because they shift the moment you bring up posture. They do! It's really funny because so I, I briefly talked about getting baselines, right? When we're talking about like patient client management and tested measures and whatnot one of the tested measures you know obviously like blood pressure etc cetera, etc cetera, uh we need to grab respiratory rate and the thing with respiratory rate is that you need to like look at the person's chest and see their breathing and you basically you count for like 30 seconds and then you multiply that number correct uh <laughs> if you tell someone hey i'm going to check your respiratory rate you're gonna start breathing a little bit differently so that's why you have to take it like secretly <laughs> <laughs> like if I take someone's pulse, I take it for a quote unquote full minute, but realistically I'm taking it for 30 seconds and then I'm staying uh, to check for the respiratory rate the other 30 seconds and then multiplying whatever value I get by two. So then I get like, you know, their beats per minute or their respiratory uh, rate per minute, roughly, you know? But yeah, a picture would be good, but sometimes people get really conscious. Like even if you take a picture, they're going to straighten out too, you know? <sighs> Anytime someone's aware, they'll try to fix themselves, which is unfortunate, but at least they have that feedback to go after, you know? <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see, let's see. Okay, so when should feedback be given? And then how much feedback should be used? So you can have frequent or, you know, which is going to be after every trial, or you can give them a summary, which is going to be after a set number of trials. You can have it faded, which is going... Oh, sorry. I meant to show my mouse. Feedback given less frequently on subsequent blocks of trials. Or a bandwidth, 
Feedback only given when performance deviates from predetermined range. No, you can't take secret pictures! Consent is like super important in healthcare. <laughs> I guess if you get consent, hey, can I secretly take a photo of you and then immediately do <laughs> It gets like strangely complicated, you know? <laughs> You're talking about for friends? I guess. I'm talking about patients. Wow. <laughs> anyway. Mm. So then you have your bandwidth, which is again, that's gonna be. Oh, I'm so sorry. Only when, again, the feedback's only given when performance deviates from predetermined range. So if they're absolutely wrong, give them that feedback. Practice how should it be spaced? Basically, you could do mass or distributed, which again, mass is gonna be lots and lots of practice, me cramming for this exam, versus distributed, where rest is gonna equal the amount of time I practice. So I either. <laughs> I study for two hours, example. So if I did distributed practice, that means my rest should be two hours or greater, which sounds really unrealistic, but <laughs> I guess that's what the book says, you know? <laughs> but yeah, and what task and task variation should be practiced? You can either do constant or variable. Constant again, this is gonna be always the same, variable is always changing. How should they be sequenced? You could do it blocked or random. Block is basically going to be, you're going to repeat the same task over and over and over again. And you got to get it good before you move on to the next one. Or we could do it random where we do multiple all at once. How should the environment be structured? You could do it closed or open. Closed is going to be predictable while open is unpredictable. And you could either do a whole task training, like let's do the whole thing. Or let's do part-time task training. Or part-time, sorry. Part task Part task training. <laughs> part task training is going to be components of the task that are practiced before the whole task. So, sit the stand sound really easy, right? But sometimes people have trouble getting up. So, maybe if you practice them scooting up or using their arms a little bit more and doing like small little movements like that, then you could do the whole task of sitting up and down. You can also do your practice lead up activities, which is going to be simpler task versions of the required complex, uh, complex tasks. Uh, that I practice uh, I'm not sure what's a good example of this but basically you simplify the activity and you do it so that's going to help you build up the confidence and the uh, idea and concept of what you really need to perform so moving on from uh, practice and feedback and whatnot let's talk about the principles of neuroplasticity so there's actually going to be 10 these are really cool. So neuroplasticity is your brain being plastic. You can mold it. You can do whatever you want with it. The brain is a really amazing thing to have. <laughs> That's why I wish to have it sometimes. <laughs> so your brain can change in several ways and how it changes. Uh, we can review that by looking at these 10 principles so number one use it or lose it i'm pretty sure you heard this one before like i know i've heard it plenty of times when i'm trying to learn spanish and i don't actively use spanish it's like you lose it <laughs> you know some of my friends actually had that happen they they had spanish as their first language but when they had moved like you know to the states they're just like yeah my my parents wanted me to learn english so now all oh, my spanish is gone and so it's like oh sucks <laughs> That really sucks, actually. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so you use it or lose it. So basically, failure to drive specific brain functions can lead to functional de uh, uh, degrade. Oh my goodness. Uh, degradation. De degradation, yes. <laughs> you can use it or improve it. So training that drives a specific brain function that can lead to enhancement of that function. So basically the opposite of lose it or use it. You're going to use it and improve it. You're always working on it to help build it up. Is this basic knowledge? No. <laughs> I'm not going to become a doctor, doctor. I'm only becoming a doctor in degree, unfortunately. <laughs> so you could call me Dr. Tipinia, but basically you can say I'm specializing in orthopedics or kinesiology. <laughs> yeah, so we could talk about uh, specificity, which is going to be the specifics about stuff and the nature of training experience that's going to dictate that nature of plasticity. So if you're learning how to sew, you're learning how to sew. You're not learning how to run. <laughs> Repetition matters. So again, like flashcards when you're studying, super important. The intensity of it is going to matter as well. If you're doing stuff that's like brain dead, you're not really paying attention. Sorry, brain dead is very like, sorry, I did not mean to say that. 
you know, you're not really paying attention, you're zombieing your way through it, you're not really building up that principle of neuroplasticity, you should make it difficult, it should make you think a little bit, you know? We also have time matters, so you have to dedicate a certain amount of time to do these things to help make those building blocks make it, you know, like they use it and improve it. <laughs> Uh, salience matters, so this is going to be a weird thing where basically you need to understand that uh, what what is salience? It's just like it's important to you. See, I I believe right. Let's see. Yeah, what the brain find uh, finds important. What would trading intensity for studying be? <laughs> hard no i don't know it's really difficult because uh, most of the stuff that you're learning yeah you know you know your brain but do you <laughs> dies digest <laughs> you know the intensity and all that jazz you know <laughs> i feel like studying is always intense because it's new knowledge you know i'm not saying it's hard difficult i'm about to cry but sometimes <laughs> Maybe intensity could not be having music or stream in the background. I, I suppose, like, if you don't want to distract yourself and you're like, but I want my music in stream, but it's like, no, no more. But I feel like it's more content intensity rather than, like, uh, changing your environment intensity. But, I mean, yeah. So, number eight, age matters, basically. Uh, as you know, kids are like sponges and can basically learn anything and everything, so... Yeah. <laughs> uh, transference. So basically understanding that even though you're doing this one training, that experience can be very similar to another. So if you are sewing, maybe you learn how to knit as well because it's something that you work closely with your hands, you know? Ah, my melody. Thank you so very much for the follow. Welcome to the cup club. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> but yeah. Mm. How do you say it? And then we have interference is going to be our last uh, principle. That's going to be plasticity in response to one experience can interfere with the acquisition of the other behaviors. Uh, I can't actually really think of one right now, unfortunately. <laughs> As a good example. That sounds kind of weird, like, oh, this interrupts it. But, ah, it is what it is. So let's talk about that motor learning again. We defined it earlier, but FTW, hi, hi. Thank you for the look. I appreciate you. Thank you for the hydrate as well. Oh, hydrate, but I'm almost done. I promise. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. All right, I'm good. I'm hydrated. Life's good. Thank you for the self cares. <laughs> Molly, hi, hi! Hello? Hello! Welcome, welcome! Sorry, you caught me at a study stream. I promise I don't only study, but that's what I'm about to do all this week, so you have to forgive me, okay? <laughs> I have an exam and I have to go meet up with a classmate in like 10 minutes, so I have to zoom! <laughs> but how are you? <laughs> welcome, welcome! So, motor learning again we defined earlier, correct? So motor learning is going to be that relatively permanent change that's going to happen over time when we're trying to practice something or do a cool task and all that jazz. So these are the stages. These are the cognitive, associative, and autonomous, 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 I can't say it anymore. Ah! <laughs> and it, cognitive is going to be basically skills are going to require your full attention under the easiest condition. Associative, eh, you're still working on it, but you're still making errors from time to time. And autonomous is basically going to be like you're independent, basically. You could do this all by yourself. You're, you're a big boy. You're a big girl now. You're a big... Yes. <laughs> and so cognitive is what to do. Associative is how to do, and autonomous is how to succeed, basically. That's the sum-up version. Oh, and then we're done! <laughs> wait, wait, and motor performance, which is another thing we need to consider, is not motor learning. Motor performance is a temporary change in motor behavior observed during practice, which is something you normally see very early in the learning process. So it's just dumb adapting to that, to get into that motor learning. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have to, I have to, um, at three o'clock I told I was going to meet up, meet up with a classmate to study and we're going to go over the same things. He's already there. No. <laughs> okay. I have to go. So 
Uh, Cubs, if you're new here, I appreciate you. Feel free to join the Discord and all that good stuff. On Twitter, I have my pinned up schedule. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, there's him. I'm doing more studying, but it's gonna be more casual because I'm I'm straight up learning. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> But feel free to join. I'll take little baby breaks here and there. 100% emoji, but in voice because uh, I would love to play Splatoon and all that jazz, you know? And socials, I have uh, YouTube, I have uh, TikTok, I have all the cool stuff. So uh, please do feel free to check it out. I think we're going to raid into... <gasps> Grimmerall! <laughs> They're doing Duolingo right now, so that's technically a study stream, right? Right? <laughs> Hopefully they're, uh, what do you call it? Uh, not about to end. They're gonna be responsible for you, Cubs, so heck. Thank you for the good luck, and thank you for being here, I appreciate ya. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's get the raid made- <laughs> The raid- <laughs> Why am I rolling my R's? A raid, a raid. <laughs> raid messages going. <laughs> Grumble has rated us a few times and I am super appreciative of it. If they're studying, we're studying. And they're learning Japanese. Let's go, fellow weeb! Or maybe they really just want to know it. <laughs> the barrier comes to seem to be working. Oh, I'm sorry. And maybe it's like BTTV. I apologize. Sato, hi, hi. I see you at the mess of the raid. I appreciate ya. Tipa's getting to her Dracula voice too much. <laughs> my my real Dracula voice. Ha ha ha. One Mississippi. I don't know Count Dracula's voice. I don't. Really, I didn't really watch Sesame Street growing up. <laughs> what? I am a vampire. <laughs> I gotta go. I gotta go. I gotta go. I bye everyone. I'll see you Thursday. Please have a good one. Please give Grumble lots of love for me as I I zoom past and all that stuff. Okay, please have a good one. If not, if I don't see you Thursday, hopefully I'll see you Friday. And if I don't see you, then get, then guess what? I'll see you next week. Have a good one. Lots of love. Stay safe and eat something super super yummy. Thank you for the head pat, bye boy. Bye bye. And bye. And goodbye. You have to go. Ah! <laughs>